Have we found another civilization? Is that a door to someone's home on another planet? Can we peek through the windows? After all, it was NASA's Curiosity rover that sent this image to Earth. And right now, this rover is exploring the surface of Mars. Unfortunately, astronomers were fast to disappoint us. They claimed that it was just a natural part of the Martian landscape. There are several clues that made them think it wasn't a real door. For example, it's tiny, a mere 3 feet high. But it might simply mean the Martians aren't that tall, you may object. But scientists keep insisting that what looks like a door is actually an opening in a rock created by natural forces, like winds and erosion. The thing is, if you look at the rock attentively, you may notice strata, the layers of silt that stand out because they're harder than the surrounding material. These strata dip here on the left and a bit higher on the right. They likely appeared around 4 billion years ago in a river or a windblown dune. Since the strata became visible, powerful Martian winds have eroded them even more. And now you can see that they disappear inside the door. And look at this. See those cracks? Yeah, those! That's how rocks weather on the red planet. This small cave probably formed when several fractures crossed the strata. A pretty large boulder might have fallen out under its own weight, and this created the door-shaped opening. Now this theory is quite plausible. Because even though the gravity on Mars isn't as strong as on Earth, it's still strong enough to do it. Besides, see that rock to the right of the opening? It has a suspiciously smooth vertical edge. It must be the culprit. It probably fell out not so long ago, and Martian winds haven't got rid of it yet. And winds on Mars can be exceptionally powerful. This planet is infamous for its intense dust storms. Sometimes they kick up so much dust that you can see it through a telescope on Earth. Such storms occur every year and cover continent-sized areas. They also last for weeks at a time. But besides these annual storms, there are even larger storms that happen much more rarely. But they're more powerful and way more intense. Those are called global dust storms because they encircle the entire planet. But even if you got caught in the most severe storm on Mars, it wouldn't be as terrible as you might think. The wind speed on the worst Martian storms reaches 60 miles an hour tops. Hurricane force winds on our planet can be twice that speed. You should also keep in mind that the atmosphere on the red planet is 1% as dense as the atmosphere on Earth. That's why, if you decided to fly a kite on Mars, you'd need the wind to be much faster than on Earth. Otherwise, you wouldn't even be able to get the kite in the air. In other words, even though it's quite windy on Mars, it doesn't feel as intense as on our home planet. Oh, by the way, you might have noticed I keep calling Mars the red planet. Why? Look, our neighbor is covered in dust, soil, and rock that is rich in iron oxide. That's what gives the surface of the planet its trademark red hue. And look, there's the trademark! Nah, just kidding. Mars is the fourth planet from the Sun. Not so far away from the star, you might say. And still, it's a cold and deserted world. The average temperature on its surface is minus 81 degrees Fahrenheit. But if you ever visit one of its poles during the wintertime, bring a lot of warm clothing. Because the temperatures are likely to drop to minus 220 degrees there. In the summer, though, you might feel very comfortable in some regions. There, the temperatures can rise to 70 degrees, not very different from what we're used to. Mars is one of the most explored space bodies in the solar system. At the moment, NASA has two rovers roaming the red landscapes, Curiosity and Perseverance. There's also one lander called InSight and Helicopter Ingenuity, nicknamed Ginny. Perseverance is the most advanced and largest rover ever sent to another world. The journey to the red planet took 203 days, and Ginny traveled to Mars attached to the belly of Perseverance. Sounds cozy. And now, I'm going to tell you something really curious. Let's say you're a Babylonian who lived around 5,000 years ago. Babylonia was an empire in ancient Mesopotamia. Just think back to 6th grade. Anyway, your neighbor comes up to you and says, what day is it today? And what do you answer? It's Mars Day! Wait, what? When the ancient Babylonians created the week, they decided to divide it into seven parts. Each day got named after some space body, like the Moon, the Sun, Venus, and so on. Mars Day was on Tuesday. The Babylonians believed that each of these space objects influenced their lives on the day named after it. 
And since Mars was red in color, they associated it with aggression. That's why on Tuesdays, they had special ceremonies to avoid the influence of the unfriendly planet. Indeed, Mars might seem unfriendly to a tired traveler. Its atmosphere is very thin. Its volume is a near 1% of the atmosphere on Earth. In other words, there's 99% less air to breathe on the red planet. Mars's atmosphere is mostly made up of carbon dioxide. At such high concentrations, it's toxic for us humans. And if you were looking for some oxygen to breathe on Mars, you'd come away empty-handed. There's only one-tenth of one percent of oxygen in the air on the red planet. That's definitely not enough for you to survive there. At the moment, Mars has two moons, Deimos and Phobos. Astronomers think they may be asteroids once caught in the gravitational field of the planet. The moons are shaped like potatoes. That's because their mass is too little for gravity to give them a spherical form. Potatoes, eh? Maybe they should be renamed mashed and au gratin. One day, Mars will get a ring of its own. It might happen in the next 20 to 40 million years. Will Brightside be there? Stay tuned. Mars' gravitational forces will tear apart the planet's largest moon, Phobos. Hey, it really will get mashed. Some chunks of the former moon will crash into Mars, and others will break apart and create the ring around the planet. This ring might exist for at least 100 million years. The surface of Mars is cut by a huge canyon system known as Vals Marineris. Mm, sounds like a pasta sauce. If it were on Earth, it'd stretch all the way from New York to California, over 3,000 miles. At its widest part, the largest canyon on Mars is 200 miles, and it reaches 4 miles at its deepest point. If you still have difficulties imagining the sheer size of this natural phenomenon, here you go. Vals Marineris is 10 times the size of the Grand Canyon on Earth. Now, since we're on the subject of gigantic things, let's talk about Olympus Mons. This is the largest volcano in the solar system, and it's on Mars too. It's three times as tall as Mount Everest on our planet, and that's the tallest mountain above sea level. And the base of Olympus Mons is as large as the state of New Mexico. Now, scientists think there could have been water on Mars in the past. What made them think so? They found lots of ancient river valley networks and lake beds on the surface of the red planet. Plus, on Mars, there are minerals and rocks that could only form in liquid water. Mars might even have experienced terrible floods 3.5 billion years ago. These days, there's still some water on the red planet, but Mars's atmosphere is too thin for this water to stay in its liquid form on the surface. Now, it only exists in the form of water ice. You can find it just under the surface of the planet in its polar regions. The only place where this water is visible is at the North Polar Ice Cap. Also, sometimes, salty water flows down crater walls and hillsides. And there are tiny quantities of water in the planet's atmosphere. But it only exists as vapor. So, as a vacation spot, I think I'll pass. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side. Hundreds of spaceships take off from Earth's surface and head toward Mars. Fast forward seven months, and this space fleet of ships is near the red planet. Soon they will all land, and a few thousand people will become citizens of Mars. Perhaps they will never return to their home planet because there will be absolutely all conditions for a comfortable life here. It takes time and many expeditions to create a self-sustaining colony on Mars. Here is how, step by step, people might build a full-fledged city there, with factories, hospitals, apartment buildings, and even clubs and restaurants. First, we need to pick a time to launch the rocket. A launch window opens once every 780 days. That's when the distance between Earth and Mars is the shortest. In this case, the journey will take about 6 to 7 months. Let's move to the launch pad. Here, we see the spacecraft connected to a booster rocket. Ignition! The booster sends the spacecraft into the air. It then undocks and lands back on Earth. At the same time, the spacecraft's engines start, and it makes its way to Earth's parking orbit. To make this ascent, the ship has used almost all its fuel and now needs refueling. To do this, we use our booster again. A huge crane places another spacecraft on the booster. There are huge fuel tanks inside the ship. The booster launches from Earth and takes the refueler into orbit. It docks with the spaceship and fills it with fuel. The journey through space may need a total of five such refuelings. 
And for the first mission to build a colony on Mars, we need five spaceships. So that's about 25 launches from Earth. Considering that the booster cost $230 million, the refueler $130 million, and the ship itself is $200 million, the price tag on the mission is pretty impressive. So, ignition. Fast forward in time, and the first five ships descend to the surface of Mars. These ships haven't brought the first humans. They carry only payloads, like fuel and water supplies, oxygen for breathing, and medical supplies. There are also first living modules, waste management systems, and a huge number of solar panels for generating electricity. Before landing, one of the ships launches a system of satellites into orbit. It'll provide communication on the red planet. So the robots begin their work on Mars. First, a whole bunch of little rovers line up and unfold solar panels. Their total area reaches the size of seven soccer fields. They're much less efficient on Mars than on Earth. Frequent sandstorms fill the working surface of the panels with sand. But at the same time, the strong winds of the red planet also help to wipe the sand away. Other rovers, equipped with powerful drills, begin searching for water in the Martian soil. When they find water, people will begin producing fuel. We'll combine carbon dioxide from the atmosphere with the mined water at a high temperature and under high pressure. It'll result in getting methane for rockets and oxygen for breathing. Since February 2021, Mars Perseverance rover has been testing the technology for oxygen extraction. It has a box inside. This is the Mars Oxygen IRSU experiment, also called MOXIE. This thing pulls Martian air inside and then, under high pressure, takes one atom of oxygen from carbon dioxide. Such a thing, about the size of a shoebox, can provide enough oxygen for one astronaut to breathe. But if you build the same mechanism but the size of a large factory, it'll produce oxygen for an entire colony and release the rest into the atmosphere of Mars. Another group of rovers is working to turn the surface of Mars into a landing zone to prepare for the next step in colonizing the red planet. By this time, the robotic population of Mars has been working on these tasks for two years and two months, and people on Earth have been waiting for a new flight window to open. This time, not five, but 12 spaceships are coming to Mars. Ten of them are cargo ships, which bring construction materials, fuel, and other supplies, as well as a lot of scientific equipment and 3D printers. Two other ships carry the first interplanetary astronauts. The doors of the spaceships open, and 30 heroes set foot on the surface of Mars for the first time in history. These people are scientists, engineers, and doctors. They have undergone a strict selection and long training to become the first people to conquer another planet. And these guys don't have a return ticket. They'll have to stay on Mars for two years. The astronauts live right in their spaceships and try to get used to the unusual conditions on Mars. The temperature here is about minus 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Also, the gravity on Mars is two and a half times weaker than on our home planet. That means a person here can jump twice as high and lift heavier objects. But the muscles in human bodies have a hard time getting used to such a difference. So astronauts can't work full time. The first thing they do is unload cargo ships and deploy life support systems. Some people are experimenting with turning Martian soil into material for 3D printers. Others are setting up greenhouses and cultivating soil to grow plants. The human waste recycling system the robots brought here is used to make fertilizer for plants. Two more years and two months have passed. We see a launch of a spaceship, not from Earth, but from Mars. The 30 astronauts have completed their mission and are on their way home. It's easier for spaceships to take off from Mars because the gravitational force here is less powerful. At the same time, ships are launched from Earth. They'll bring nearly 100 new inhabitants and even more cargo to Mars. When this space fleet arrives at the red planet, the astronauts can taste the first food grown here. 3D printers begin building homes on Mars. They print outer shells from Martian soil and plant waste. These shells will protect the dwellings from solar radiation and strong winds. And inside the shells, people will build permanent houses. They're inflatable and are equipped with modules brought directly from the spaceships. These houses have living bays, research bays, and communication centers. The construction goes on for two more years until the next flight window opens again. Some astronauts leave Mars, but more and more people come here with every new mission. They no longer live in spaceships. There are comfortable underground houses and 3D printed shelters. Most of the food is already produced on Mars. A new generation of robots works together with farmers. 
other robots help to build even more houses to accommodate the ever-increasing human population. Two more years have passed. Various space agencies launch their missions to Mars. There are more people, more scientific equipment, and even tanks with fish. In 2035, Mars and Earth are at a record short distance. So people send a huge fleet of ships with astronauts and construction materials. By this time, the human colony looks like a small city with many interconnected domes. Its inhabitants have already begun building an underground network of tunnels to move between houses, laboratories, and factories. They've also built the first hospital. Two years later, the population of Mars reaches the 1500 mark. Almost all of these people will become permanent residents of the planet. Four years and two more launch windows later, the first restaurant opens its doors. Also, the construction of a nuclear power plant begins. Once it's finished, the Martians will no longer need constant supplies from Earth. From above, the colony looks like a small town. There's a farming section where food is grown, a living section, and a factory district. And with each new mission, people bring more and more solar panels. Now their total area equals dozens of soccer fields. All this allows the astronauts to feel at home. They also don't have to wait for food supplies from Earth. 20 years of the human colony on Mars. Its population is now about 30,000 people. Workers begin to bring their families to Mars. The first schools are built here. 30 years. The population is already over 100,000 people. The colony's infrastructure allows it to be completely self-sufficient. People produce enough food, get enough fuel and oxygen. Around this time, the first plants start growing in Martian soil. There's more and more oxygen in the planet's atmosphere. The trees planted in greenhouses contributed to this. The greenhouse effect from all the human activity helps warm up the surface of Mars, if only a bit. People still have to wear spacesuits when they go outside. It will take many more years until people will be able to breathe on Mars like they do on Earth. Gradually, rivers and lakes will appear. Green plants will cover most of the land. And then the inhabitants of Mars will be able to go outside without an oxygen helmet and call the red planet, now green, their home. You take a rocket to the moon. It lands. You put on your work uniform and go to work your shift at a local factory that extracts water from beneath the surface of the moon. There's also fuel plants here. Dozens of people in rovers are roaming the expanse of Earth's natural satellite. When your shift ends, you board the rocket again. It takes you back home, just like a regular bus. That's exactly what NASA is planning to do. And the first stage of this project is the Prime 1 mission. Prime stands for Polar Resources Ice Mining Experiment. The mission starts in 2022. Let's follow it step by step. A booster rocket and second stage are assembled on the launch pad. Ignition. The rocket's engines begin to burn fuel, and we go up. Soon, the rocket reaches a speed of about 24,000 miles per hour. At that speed, you could travel the distance from New York to London in just eight minutes. Once the booster uses up all its fuel, it undocks and makes a soft landing on Earth. The second stage with the payload capsule fires its engines a couple of seconds after the first stage undocks, so the rocket continues moving up. Once it reaches orbit, the payload capsule opens. It releases the lunar lander Nova C. It's a cylindrical spacecraft, as long as a sedan, and slightly wider than the height of the average person. It starts its engine and begins its journey. First, the lander makes a circle around Earth. This is a gravitational maneuver that helps it to gain speed without wasting too much fuel. Because the lunar lander is still in orbit, Earth's gravity affects it. The spacecraft looks as if it's falling, but not to the surface of our planet, along its orbital trajectory. After one lap around Earth, the lander adjusts its trajectory and heads for the moon. The distance it needs to cover is 238,600 miles. That's like 9.5 trips around Earth, or 93 trips across the United States from coast to coast. Modern spacecraft can cover this distance in as little as nine hours. That's a bit more than a journey from New York to Los Angeles by plane. At the same time, it took the first astronauts about 72 hours to get to the moon. Soon, Nova C is near its destination. It makes another circle around the moon while it descends. Scientists have already chosen the perfect plane for it to land. There are several requirements. First of all, 
there should be signs that there might be ice under the surface in this location. Second, the lunar module should be able to maintain radio communication with Earth, and this is impossible if the lander is on the far side of the moon. When the first astronauts flew around Earth's natural satellite, contact with them was lost for a few minutes. The connection only resumed when their spacecraft came out of the lunar shadow. And the last requirement for the landing area is sunlight. The lander has solar panels to power its scientific equipment, onboard computers, and communication modules, so it needs direct sunlight. The lander is getting closer to the surface of the moon. The spacecraft is slowing down as it approaches the landing site. Now, it's almost hovering in midair. A few more seconds, and touchdown. The spacecraft makes a soft landing. It's time to drill through the surface. For this, the lander has a device called the regolith, an ice drill for exploring new terrain. To put it simply, it's a large, three-foot-long drill. That's almost as long as a grown-up person's leg. Once the right spot is chosen, the device gets lowered into the lunar soil. Drilling will have several stages. Lander will have to lift the drill several times to get the soil out of the drill hole. Otherwise, it may damage the drill bit. Next, the lander will have to analyze the soil composition. To do this, it carries a mass spectrometer, observing lunar operations. Shortly, M. Solo. Its work is based on a simple principle. It ionizes or charges particles of soil, making them move. Then it creates a strong magnetic field, which affects the charged particles, making them change their trajectory. Different substances, their molecules, and atoms move differently in the magnetic field. So, by analyzing the changes in their trajectories, we can identify the mass and charge of each particle. All we need to do next is look at Mandeleev's periodic table and see which atoms we can find in the samples. Scientists hope to find H2O, water. The south pole of the moon is an ideal place to keep ice within reach of our drill. The equator would be a great place to maintain radio contact and power the solar panels of the lander, but this area is likely to be too hot to have any ice. The lander will also carry a lunar hopper. This thing will be used to explore the surface of the moon. It will carry a load of about two pounds. Scientists will also test 4G communication technology. The lander should have some special modules for this. If the test is successful, people might be able to use cellular coverage for communication on the moon, like we do on Earth. But the main goal of the mission is to prove that the resources found on the moon can be used in the future. As early as 2023, NASA plans to send an autonomous rover called VIPER, which stands for the Volatiles Investigating Polar Exploration Rover, to the moon. It'll land at the moon's south pole for the same reasons, the connection with Earth and sunlight. The rover itself will be about the size of a golf cart. It'll carry a drill and soil analyzer. Scientists have already laid out a route for the rover. It's about 10 to 15 miles long. It'll take Viper 100 days to travel along that route. It'll drill the soil in search of lunar ice and mark its findings on the map. It will be necessary to prepare for astronauts' arrival to the moon. It'll also help to provide them with valuable resources, like water. Later in the 20s, NASA will launch the Artemis mission. For this purpose, scientists have been constructing the Orion spacecraft for decades. It can carry six astronauts. The launch vehicle that will take Orion into orbit is called the Space Launch System. When ready, it'll be the most powerful rocket in human history. The first flight will be uncrewed. It's scheduled for 2022. Like the lunar lander, the spaceship will ascend into orbit, make one revolution around our planet, and go to the moon. Once it reaches the satellite, it'll stay in orbit for six days and then return to Earth. It'll spend a total of 25 days in outer space. The second mission is planned for September 2023. This time, we'll send four astronauts to the moon. They will fly around Earth's natural satellite and return without landing on the lunar surface. This will be the first crewed mission to the moon since 1972. The third mission, Artemis III, is scheduled for the 55th anniversary of the first lunar landing in 2024. Four astronauts will travel to the moon's orbit. Once there, two of them will move to the starship HLS. This is a new lunar lander designed by SpaceX. Then they will make a soft landing on the moon's surface. The astronauts will spend several days there. Then the lander will fly back into orbit, dock with Orion, 
in return to Earth. There's also plans to build a space station in lunar orbit, the Lunar Orbitable Platform Gateway. It'll be almost like the International Space Station. It'll be assembled from a lot of modules, just like the ISS. There will be a power and propulsion element. This is going to be the first module equipped with engines for maneuvering and propulsion. There will also be solar panels that will power the station. One more module will serve several purposes, including communication and refueling. Then, there will be several living modules. They will be able to host several astronauts for a period of up to 90 days. That's where they will eat, sleep, train, and conduct scientific experiments. The station will be equipped with a robotic arm. It'll help spacecraft dock with the station, as well as install additional scientific equipment outside the station. There will be an airlock module. Incoming spacecraft will be able to dock with the station there. It'll be like a parking lot for dropping off and picking up passengers. Astronauts will be able to use it as a door to outer space. There will be a sample return vehicle, a small spacecraft, that will deliver samples of lunar soil to the station. It'll be fully robotic. The gateway will be much smaller than the ISS. For comparison, the near-Earth station now consists of 11 modules, and its total cost is about $150 billion. In the future, we'll use this station as a launch pad to send spaceships to other planets, like Mars or into deep space. Rockets launched from the ISS will need much less fuel because they won't have to fight Earth's gravity. But the astronauts on the Gateway will be in more danger than on the ISS because of radiation. Earth's magnetic field acts as a shield that disperses the sun's harmful rays. And astronauts staying there don't get much more radiation than the passengers of a commercial airplane on Earth. The moon is too far from our planet's magnetic field so all the modules of the Gateway Station will have to be additionally protected from solar radiation.